Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Corey DeAngelis ranks with Leonard Leo and Andrew Sullivan as a public intellectual who actually moves the ball. That's not an exclusive club. It's just the first three that comes to mind. There would not be same-sex marriage in America without Andrew Sullivan. Leonard Leo rebuilt, built actually the Federalist Society from the ground up, and as a result, we have great conservative judges. And now school reform, school choice, breaking the public education monopoly is uh, top on the list of priorities for Corey DeAngelis from the American Federation for Children. Good morning, Corey. How are you? Hey, good morning. Doing well. Thanks for having me, Hugh. Corey, I know you got your PhD from the University of Arkansas, so I won't ask you anything about football. But uh, would you tell people how you got into this business of being perhaps the preeminent advocate for genuine reform of education in America? Yeah, I started as a researcher at the University of Arkansas doing my PhD in education policy, where my first study looked at the effects of the Milwaukee Private School Choice Program, which has been around for decades, on adult criminal activity. We were able to link the student level data to crime later on in life and found being exposed to the program, having private school choices associated with significant reductions in criminal activity later on in life by the time the students were around 25 to 30 years of age. So I started doing research. I started to see pretty quickly I did not want to be part of the university system where your peers in the peer review process are actually your enemies. Uh, so instead, I went into think tanks and I've been an advocate uh, ever since, still doing research, but making the case mostly in media now and uh, pushing to fund students as opposed to systems. Now, Corey, I think it's been a revolutionary two years for school choice. Can you tell us what has happened? I think it began in Florida and West Virginia. It has spread to other systems. Arizona's gone in whole hog. Can you give us the overview of where we are on school choice? Yeah, it's been a banner couple of years for school choice, and it's all the teachers unions own doing. I mean, they just keep stepping in it over and over again. They pushed and lobbied the CDC to keep the schools closed, despite uh, Randy Weingarten trying to re rewrite history, which who, by the way, a, a couple of months ago, I woke up on a Monday morning, probably around this time or a little earlier, and I thought I was reading a ba Babylon Bee headline, but instead it was a tweet from her in Ukraine saying that she was there at the front lines to assess the situation. What the heck was she doing in Ukraine? What, what was she going to do, make the war go remote like she did with our schools? Uh, but look, because they've, they've fought to keep the schools closed, parents got to see what was going on in the classroom and they started to see that they're sending their kids to institutions where they feel like their kids were being brainwashed for 13 years to hate them. Uh, so, look, Vody Bauckham said it best. Uh, we cannot continue sending our children to Caesar for their education and be surprised when they come home as Romans. Well, the parents are no longer surprised. They've woken up. And in 2021, we had the banner, the best year for school choice in U.S. history, 19 states expanding uh, programs to fund students as opposed to systems. 2022, Arizona going all in with Governor Ducey and their one seat majority uh, Republican uh, legislature uh, empowering every single family, regardless of income, to choose the school that works best for them, whether it's public, private, charter or home based education. And then in 2023, this is shaping up to be another record setting year. We have Iowa, Governor Reynolds passing a universal school choice, uh, signing into law last week, a universal school choice program and also Governor Cox in Utah uh, just on Saturday signing into law another universal school choice initiative. So over time, throughout throughout the past few decades, there have been incremental reforms of you know slightly expanding school choice to, to disadvantaged populations, and then Arizona being the first one to be the first government school monopoly domino to fall. West Virginia as well in the past couple of years. Now we're seeing these big proposals all across the country in red states. It's looking like a universal school choice revolution has ignited. That's what I'm, I'm getting to it. For years when we spoke about school choice, it was about getting uh, poor children out of terrible schools. That's how it began. Get, let's get a voucher to get in Cleveland, in a, very, a variety of places. Let's get kids out of terrible schools. Now it's get every kid to the school they choose to learn in. And it is a renaissance. I'm a product of Catholic education. It's a renaissance for Catholic education. It's a renaissance for private education. Arizona is the model, I think. It began in Florida with Governor Jeb Bush. It's gotten whistles and bells everywhere. How does Arizona work, Corey DeAngelis? And do you think of it as the model? Yeah, Arizona is the model. It's something called an education savings account program for all families, regardless of background. And you, you're allowed to take your children's state-funded education dollars. Look, K-12 education is funded through state, local, and federal dollars. With the Arizona Initiative, it's a state-level policy. 
you can take about half your total funding that would have been allocated towards you in the government school. In Arizona, that's about $7,000 per student. If you want to keep the public school, you can do that. If you like your public school, you can keep your public school. That money will continue to go there, and that option is still on the table. But if not, the $7,000 follows you to your child to an education savings account, which the parents can direct. You can use it for private school tuition and fees. You can pay for charter schools. You can pay for home-based education expenses like curriculum or private tutors or educational therapies for students with special needs, any approved education expenditure. It's funding the student, not the system. It's the gold standard. And if you have any unused funds from year to year, because let's say your tuition is less than, than 7,000, you can uh, take that additional thousand, roll it over to the next year. That's the savings account component. And if you have any leftover after 12th grade, you can use it for uh, post-secondary education uh, for four years. So this is the model. But I'm Others so fascinated by the um, secondary impacts of this. In Arizona, for example, are the best teachers going to move to a model of, I will tutor 10 students a week, I will make $70,000 a year, and I will provide for my own retirement and benefits. Is that happening? Yeah, look, this is a benefit for students and families, obviously, they get a choice, but it's also a benefit for employees because competition in the labor market is great for employees. It gets it gives their employers an incentive to spend money wisely. And then look, yeah, what you pointed out is absolutely correct, that teachers will have more autonomy. They can start their own schools, basically, and they're doing it. There's some uh, an organization called Prenda Microschools that has expanded uh, like wildfire in Arizona where five to 10 children get together in a household, it's called a micro school, and you can essentially economize on the process of homeschooling. Families are already using the education savings account dollars to directly fund the teacher, uh, or at least more directly do so through the parent and cut out all the administrative bloat and fixed cost that you get with the, this factory model school system that wastes so much money year after year. And Washington Post, actually, for being a pretty crappy uh, outlet, uh, published a story. on. Hey, that's my newspaper, Corey. Tree. Stop that. I'm a columnist <laughs> for them. Uh, but New, Jer but look, New Jersey, uh, there was a public school teacher where the um, they had been in the system for decades. And the teacher uh, left during the pandemic to have a smaller class size, more autonomy. And they were actually making more money at the same time. Now, uh, talk to me a little bit about the one objection I've heard. Ohio should follow quickly. They have a super majority. They're committed to the backpack funding bill. Aaron Bear is my friend there from the Center for Christian Virtue. Very much into this. I believe it will pass. The one objection I heard, the legit objection, is that rural schools serve very large parts of the rural community and that they'll go under with school choice. I personally don't believe that will happen, but how do you respond to that, Corey? Yeah, one, it's basically the two button meme. If you've seen the guy sweating where he's trying to figure out which button to press, it's because the, the lawmakers will come and they'll try to use this as a convenient excuse. And they'll say two things that are logically incompatible with one another. They'll say, one, I can't use this in, or my constituents can't use this. There's not a lot of private schools in my area. And then two, they'll say this will decimate our, our great rural public schools. Well, one, if the rural public schools are so great, they won't be decimated because families will choose to stay there. And then two, if you really don't have exit options in your area, well, then your public school should be the safest out of any area of the state. You should be the last people voting against this. It's just a convenient excuse for Republicans to come out against their party platform to side with the establishment, the superintendents and teachers unions in their area. But this has become more of a GOP litmus test issue in recent years. So I don't think this convenient excuse is going to work anymore. Uh, these are the, the areas that have the highest concentration of Republican voters who overwhelmingly uh, support school choice. This is on the Republican Party platform. And uh, I've also listed on Twitter the nine most rural states in America, according to Census Bureau data, including West Virginia. And they all have some form of private school choice and their rural schools are fine. Florida has rural schools and they've had school choice for decades as well. And their public schools have gotten better. There have been 11 studies in Florida on this. 10 of the 11 find positive effects of school choice competition on the public schools too. This is a rising tide that lifts all boats. Corey, how do people help you? You are, you are tireless. I mean, you're always on the road. I follow your Twitter account, DeAngelis Corey, for those of you who don't know. And Corey is all, you were in uh, Arkansas, which is going to follow with the universal school choice pretty quickly, I think, under Governor Huckabee. But how do people help you out? Do they go to the American Federation for Children? How do they support the effort? 
Yeah, you can support us at federationforchildren.org. And also, if you want to help us in the fight for education freedom, you can sign the Education Freedom Pledge. It's just educationfreedompledge.com. And you can keep up with bills that are moving in your state. And there's going to be a lot of them. This is spreading like wildfire. It's a universal school choice revolution. And it's uh, absolutely glorious to watch unfold. So education freedom there are some, There are some ancillary benefits. And I'm hoping that some red states will do away with teacher tenure. To me, the worst thing to have happened to American public education is teacher tenure. I love teachers. I know great teachers. They're never going to get fired. But we've got a lot of dead weight and non-performing teachers. I could tell you, my kids all went to public school for 12 years. And they all had, so that's 36 major teachers. And they had, there was a best and there was a worst. And the worst is still there. So my question is, when does that change? When do red states embrace the market and empower principals and superintendents to chop the dead wood out. Yeah, we'll see that when, when that unfolds. I mean, perhaps Florida will take that step. Uh, DeSantis has already been pushing for paycheck protection, which is basically uh, the, the teachers would have to opt into paying their union dues each week, which I think is empowering for teachers too. But I think you're right that uh, while we are empowering families with choice, we should also empower the public schools to have uh, more flexibility as well so they can up their game and compete. And one way to do that is to be able to fire the lowest performers. So I think uh, that we should be reforming the system, but then also allowing families to have choice at the same time. You know, Dr. Arn is on every week and the Hillsdale Initiative in Charter Schools is very, very successful and it's spreading like wildfire. He does point out that when you run into teachers unions, they are extraordinarily powerful in some states. What has happened to the teachers unions where school choices come, whether it's Utah, Iowa, Arizona, or West Virginia? Yeah, I mean, I don't think their influence has really changed, uh, but uh, politicians start to listen to a new special interest group. I mean, think about Florida with DeSantis's 2018 victory being owed to, in part, due to school choice moms. His opponent, Andrew Gillum, uh, should have won. He, he, DeSantis ended up with a narrow victory because his opponent, Gillum, called to get rid of private school choice or came out against it. There were 100, over 100,000 families, low-income families, who would have disproportionately uh, voted for Gillum in the past who made that a single-issue vote for DeSantis. It works for politicians. I hope they're listening. Corey DeAngelis, everybody follow him on Twitter, DeAngelis. Corey, and you'll know what's going on with school choice. Thank you, Corey. Thank you so much, Hugh.